Welcome to episode number 32 of the MMA Rundown. This is a big week, big week for both MMA and then also some of the grappling arts. So for MMA, we got the return of the UFC with UFC DC just happening. We also have UFC 245 coming up next week. Uh, for grappling, we had a really cool grappling versus wrestling match between Bo Nickel and Gordon Ryan, so I'll recap that. Another one that was just announced between Pat Downey and Nick Rodriguez, so I'll preview that. Uh, then from there, we have CKLV, the Cliff Keen Las Vegas wrestling tournament, which was one of the first big early season tournaments in college wrestling that just took place. So I'll recap the results from there. And then a few more things to talk about. We have Henan Barrow and Liz Carmouche. Barrow, former UFC bandweight champion. Carmouche, a former two-time title contender. Both of them were just cut this week, so I'll talk about those releases there. We have the IBJJF Nogi Worlds coming up. Uh, so I'll go through the registration list and preview some of the divisions there at Black Belt. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about on this podcast is going to be Tito Ortiz getting a win over Alberto Del Rio. This wasn't something I was planning on talking about just because the fight was pretty pointless and it was pretty clear who was going to win from the start. But given the attention that was brought upon it afterwards by the president, I figured I might as well touch on it a little bit. But that might not even last a whole minute just to recap that. But that will be a topic to, to bring up. Uh, but at the start, we're going to start with the UFC. So we have the fight night. Uh, that was headlined by Alistair Overeem and Yarazino Rosenstroik. This fight ended, ended in a knockout by Rosenstroik with four seconds left to go. There's a lot of talk about whether or not the stoppage was correct. I would say the stoppage, it, it, it's a tricky one because it, it doesn't look as though Morgliato was planning on stepping in right away. He was going to give Overeem a chance to defend himself. It looked like he was out um, when he was falling against the fence, but he did brace himself with both of his hands and was starting to come up. Uh, so... With, with um, Rosenstreich walking away, it's not as though Merkliada is under any obligation to stop the fight just because Rosenstreich's not fighting anymore. And if he wanted, he could have stepped in and seen that Overeem was still there and decided to let it keep going, let it go until um, the round ends, and at that point, Overeem would have won a decision. So for Rosenstreich, a bit of a risky move in, in, in walking away when he did. I, I can understand that when you see a guy falling back the way that Overeem did, you figure he's out and the fight's over. So I, I get why he did it, but... Given the situation, I think he got a little bit lucky that Overeem was, in fact, um, unable to, to stand up and move forward. He just kind of, like, fell off to the side, and that was when Dan Merkliada decided to stop the fight. He also saw the lip, um, which was absolutely just cut up by or cut up on Overeem and decided that was also probably a good point to stop the fight. It's a little bit risky by Rosenstrike to, to do what he did at that point, but he does get the win. As far as how the rest of the fight went... I understand and think that Alistair Overeem had the right idea in terms of trying to take Rosenstrike down. Rosenstrike did not show a whole lot on the ground. His, his grappling didn't look very good. His jiu-jitsu didn't look very good. Uh, that's not to say that Overeem isn't good on the ground. Overeem's pretty solid on the ground himself. It's just we haven't seen a whole lot because he's a very good striker. Um, but over time, he's he just taken so many shots to the head that he's gone out pretty quickly. And for him to say, hey, look, I, I might have a technical edge here, but it's better off for me to just try to make this a grappling match, I think that was the right choice. He did land a lot of good shots, particularly with the body kicks, and Rosenstrike took him well. Um, but for Overeem, I, I think he had the right idea there trying to take the fight to the match, is that once he got there, it, it felt as though because he had a lot of difficulty in getting Rosenstrike down, he, he had to work a lot to get those takedowns, uh, that once he had it on the mat, he was more concerned about just kind of staying on top than actually advancing position and getting into positions where he can really posture up and, uh, and land some heavy shots. Uh, so I, I think Overeem was a bit conservative on the ground, and that, that definitely cost him, because obviously this fight went until the fifth round, and he eventually got caught. Um, but for the most part... He showed that he had a had a real big edge in the grappling, and that's a that's a hole for a Rosenstrike, and was able to make him pay for it. So for Overeem, uh, another loss here to a guy who was ranked 14. I, I don't think anyone ever expected Rover, Overeem to get back into a title fight, let alone win it. So it, it's not as though this fight means that he can't keep fighting at heavyweight. He can't keep having big fights. I think that's that's still on the table for him. So I don't know that anything really changes there. But if there's any hope on his end about getting back to a title fight, this probably um, pushes that back for quite a bit. For Rosenstroik, huge win, puts him in the top 10 most likely. Obviously, it exposes a big hole in his game with the grappling, uh, but if he gets his fight with Francis Ngannou next, I don't know that Ngannou is going to be trying to take him down, though it's possible that he might. Uh, so for him, it, it, it makes it a little more clear that where he's at. I think when you have a guy like Rosenstroik who's finishing a lot of guys fast, you don't exactly know how good they are and uh, where the skill lies in each different position because they aren't spending enough time there. It, at least with this, it, it sort of puts him in... Um, puts him in a position where you, you kind of get an idea of where he's at. We, we've seen other guys in the heavyweight division who have been pretty dangerous strikers but haven't had the grappling. Tai Tuivas is one who comes to mind right away where it's not as like he was the most technical striker, but he, he definitely hit hard and was able to work his way into the top ten. But as his grappling got exposed, he um, he got put on a pretty quick uh, losing streak. Derek Lewis at times, 
he's got decent boxing. I don't know that I would say that his striking is as good as Rosen strikes, although his power might be a little bit a little bit better. Um, but he's he's had his moments uh, where some some good grapplers have definitely made him pay. Daniel Cormier just wrote him out the entire time that they had their title fight before he ended up finishing him. So for Rosen strike, it, it's a good win. It's a big name. It, it definitely puts him up higher in the division. It's going to make make him a lot of money. But I don't know that after watching that fight, do you have any hopes that he's going to be a guy who's going to be causing problems for guys like Stipe Miocic? Obviously, Cormier is not going to be around long enough to to run into Rosenstrike, but any other guys who can wrestle pretty well. Maybe even a guy like Sergey Spivak, who just got a win over Tai Tui Vasa. That might be a tough matchup for Rosenstrike. So he's got a lot of improvement to make before he before he wins the title in the UFC, but we, we still see that his striking is pretty good. We still see that he, he has a lot of power there. He was able to, to pull a victory out of the jaws of defeat here with his knockout power, and for that, you definitely have to give him credit. As far as the rest of the card, uh, the fight before that in the Comey was Marina Rodriguez versus Cynthia Calvillo. Cynthia missed weight by about four pounds. And Rodriguez was winning this fight for the most part, uh, prior to getting taken down and getting stuck on her back and unable to get back up. The interesting thing, thing for me with Rodriguez is that she's had some pretty good fights um, prior to this one with Calvillo, where she was able to stuff a lot of takedowns. Was stuffing a lot of takedowns in this fight, too, before she eventually got taken down. And with that being said, it, it made it seem as though Rodriguez, who coming into this fight was 12-0, and 0, uh, would be an interesting matchup for someone like Zhang Weili if, if that fight ever comes into fruition. With this being a draw, that, that sort of slows her down and, and forces her to take a little bit more time and probably get a couple more wins than she otherwise would have needed to, to get to that title shot. But I, I still think she's a pretty difficult matchup for the champion, uh, depending on how Zhang Weili does against um, Joanna Young Jacek once that fight happens. For Calvillo, um, I mean, good work on top when she got there. Definitely struggled on the feet. Making weight's going to be an issue, it seems. Again, one of the interesting things here with uh, women's MMA is that it, with men, it's a lot more predictable uh, how easy a weight cut's going to be. Uh, with women, if you hit the wrong time of the month, that could definitely be an issue. And I think there may be uh, more, weight, cut, more um, weight cuts gone awry in the women's divisions than there have been in the men's, and I think that may be a reason why. I'm not saying that I'm like... I, I'm not saying that I know that Cynthia Cavio, um had to make this weight cut at the wrong time of month, but it, it's possible that that's the case. And if that is the case, then that means the next time she comes around, it, it, it may be a little bit more easy for her to make 115, and that might be more natural for her. Uh, so we'll see where she goes from here, but I, I feel like she kind of got lucky in that being a 10-8 a round there and her, her getting a draw because it looked like she was probably going to lose that fight otherwise. Uh, then Stefan Struve was doing well against Ben Rothwell, took a couple shots to the groin. Uh, there was some talk about the ref pushing Struve to continue a little bit quicker. I mean, it's not as though Mergliata wasn't trying to to push him along, but it's not like he made him either. It's not like he said, you, you can't take any more time. Um, but whatever the case may be, Struve decides to return a little bit quicker and um, ends up getting put out and finished right before the end of the end of the second round. And so Rothwell gets a TKO here, but it's not exactly one that he can feel too good about, I don't think. Then we had Yana Kunitskaya versus Aspen Ladd. Um, from a striking standpoint, this fight was actually pretty even. Um, if you look at the stats, at least 92 to 85 for Kunitskaya, 47 to 47 on significant strikes. Um, but third round comes around, Lad is potentially trailing corners, getting in her face, saying, "Look, you, you got to go for it now. You got to really put the pressure on her. Every time you're hitting her, she's backing up." And Lad's able to, to land a big, I believe it was a left that dropped her, gets on top, um, does enough ground and pound to get the win, and the ref steps in. Uh, so big win for Aspen Lad over Kunitskaya. Kunitskaya hasn't exactly had a whole ton of success in the UFC ever since coming over from Invicta, but I, either way, a big win for Ladd. And in a division at 135 where contenders just keep getting knocked off over and over and over again by, by the champion Amanda Nunes. So even though the loss to GDR took her off the path to, to fight Nunes, with the division sort of being a little bit weak on the top, a win like this definitely helps Ladd and gets her closer to that title fight that she was getting close to prior to that previous loss. Then we have another draw between Cody, Cody Stamen and Cody Stamen and Song Yudong. Uh, this fight, you would probably give the first round to Yudong, but I thought Stamen won the next two, so ends up going to a draw again. Uh, this one was 28-28, 28-28, and then also 29-27. But I, I definitely thought Cody Stamen won this fight, and for Song Yudong, it, it's good for him that he, he doesn't take the loss here. Um, but I think most people who watched it get the feeling that Stamen beat him. And my theory about Yudong heading into this fight is that he, he's a good fighter, he's an explosive fighter, but he's kind of one of those guys who comes up, um, works their way through some unranked guys, gets some flashy knockouts, and then once he starts facing the top guys, struggles a bit, sort of like a Duho Choi type. And it looks as though that theory seems to be um, fairly correct with Yudong as well. And then we had a fight between Rob Font and Ricky Simone. 
uh, where Font was shown a little bit more than just the usual striking we got at him, but the striking was still on point and was enough for him to get the win here. Uh, he gets a win over, over Ricky Simone by unanimous decision. Uh, one judge gave it gave him all three rounds. The other two gave him two rounds to one over Ricky Simone. On the prelims, we had Tiago Alves uh, getting caught in guillotine up against the fence by Tim Means. We had Billy Corantillo dominating against Jacob Kilburn. Uh, the win... If you look at the numbers, it's just absurd. The total strikes were 139 for Quarantillo to 6 for Kilburn. Significant strikes were 74 to 3. Uh, but once he got him on the ground, which is absolutely controlling him from there, ends up finishing this by triangle choke. And more important than the win, got a black belt wrapped around his waist afterwards. So really, really great night for Billy Quarantillo. And I think today's his birthday, actually, as well. So pretty good weekend, all in all. Uh, then we had Bryce Mitchell getting a twister submission over Matt Sales. And Joe Selecki with a unanimous decision over Matt Wyman. And then for the early prelims, Verna Janderoba got a rear naked choke against Mallory Martin in a fight that wasn't very good. And Mahmoud Muradov with just a great display of striking against Trevor Smith prior to, to landing a giant right hand that just sent Smith's mouthpiece flying and him just face planting to the ground. Uh, one of them, one of the nastier looking knockouts you'll ever see. So that was it for UFC DC. For UFC 245, we have three title fights on top of the card. At this point, none of them have required anyone to pull out, which is good, and let's hope it stays that way. We still have a week, though, so we got to cross our fingers here. Maybe knock on wood. Well, it's not wood, but... <laughs> okay, that's wood. Um, so, main event. Kamaru Usman versus Colby Covington. Usman is the reigning champion. Covington was the interim champion after defeating RDA. Had it stripped after he wasn't able to take a quick fight on short notice against Tyron Woodley, which that fight was then taken by Darren Till, who lost that fight. Uh, had an opportunity to fight Kamaru Usman in January, didn't take it when they were in need of a main event, so for that reason, Usman ends up leapfrogging Colby for a title fight, ends up fighting against Tyron Woodley in March, gets the win there, and now he's the champion, hasn't fought since. Meanwhile, Colby Covington had been waiting, sitting out for a while, decided to take a quick fight with Robbie Lawler, dominated that fight, and here we are with Kamaru versus Colby. Really tough fight for me to judge, or for me to call, just because both of these guys fight very similar styles, so it's just going to be a question of, you know what both guys want to do, it's going to be a question of who's going to be able to do it. Part of me feels like Colby, if I'm just looking at what I see in the cage, I, I feel like the edge would probably go to Colby just because I think his, his striking volume is a lot better. I, I think he does a good job of mixing up um, punches where he, he's throwing for volume and punches where he's actually like throwing to to land and cause serious damage. Uh, I figure he'd be able to keep a better pace as well. But the fact that Covington has had a lot of different opportunities to take this fight with Usman and hasn't, it, it, it makes me wonder what the reasoning is for that. It's not as though he's like had an aversion to fighting guys who aren't the most exciting out there. So it's not like he's refusing to fight Usman because he, he wants to put on an exciting fight. It, to me, him not wanting to, to fight Usman either tells me it's, he, he just thinks it's more difficult than some of the other options out there, but maybe he can still win. Uh, but rather than it being a fight that he, he thinks he wins like 90% of the time, it might be a fight he thinks he wins 70% of the time. Maybe that's his thought process. Uh, or maybe he has reason to believe this is a fight that's a bad matchup for him, and that's why he's avoided it to this point. And... Though that's not a technical analysis of the fight, I, I think that there there is something there to, that needs to be looked at for Colby not taking this fight as many times as he has. Um, but from what I see technically, both of these guys are, are, are capable of running their opponents down into the fence, uh, putting on volume, forcing them to deal with punches, then shooting underneath, taking him down and controlling from top. I can definitely see either of these guys doing that to each other. Colby is definitely capable of taking down Kamaru. Kamaru is definitely taking, capable of taking down Colby. The question is going to be, uh, in terms of these takedowns, who's going to be able to dominate on the feet? And, and really set those takedowns up. Because if Colby isn't able to, to offer enough for Kamaru to be concerned about on the feet, then how's he really ever going to be able to set up a deep shot where he's going to get in and get a takedown? Same thing for Kamaru. If he can't um, put Colby on his back foot and put Colby in a position where he's not prepared for a takedown, how's he going to be able to finish? Uh, so to me, this is one of those fights that's, fights that's a toss-up. It's a really exciting fight. It, the storylines themselves, I'm a little upset that we haven't seen as many promos as, as there should be for this. There's definitely a great storyline here for this fight, and I don't feel like that storyline has been told. Uh, so that's a little bit frustrating, but for me, I'm going to watch this fight regardless. It's just a, I'd like to see some more casual interest in this as well, because um, more casual fans who get into this, the the more money that's spent on the pay-per-view, more money that's spent on the pay-per-view, more money that the fighters make, and more money that the fighters make, uh, the more likely another fight like this is going to be put together, because the UFC is definitely not averse to making money. Um, coming event, we have Max Holloway versus Alexander Volkanovsky. This is another one of those fights where it, it's tough for me to get a, get a good read on this, because Volkanovsky is a very, very technically sound fighter. Uh, particularly on the feet, and Holloway is also that way. You would figure that 
th- there's a good chance that if this goes like most Max Holloway fights, that Volkanovski's going to have some early success. Uh, Holloway's going to get his reads on him, and as, it's, as the fight goes on, as long as it stays standing, uh, over time, Holloway's going to continue to build on um, build on those reads and start to take over. Uh, for Volkanovski, for him to, to stop that, he's either going to have to mix takedowns into it, or he's going to have to be able to rock Holloway and, and force him into really purely defensive positions. Uh, is he going to have the strength to, or the power to, to rock Holloway? He does. I, I just don't know that he's going to. Uh, as far as the takedowns, it, it's sort of hard to tell because one of the things with Volkanovski is he's got very long arms for his frame. And where, where that can benefit him is that if he does get in on a takedown, it, it's easier for him to, to close his hands, to, to lock his hands, and be able to finish a takedown off of that. I, I just don't know how successful he's going to be in, in closing the range just in, in terms of striking, let alone uh, being able to, to get in on a shot. So for me, this is another one of those fights where I'm not comfortable picking it. I'm not comfortable betting on it. Uh, and it's one that I definitely want to see because I'm, I'm curious to see how it goes, especially with Volkanovski getting the wins over Jose Aldo and Chad Mendes. He really impressed me a lot in those fights, and I didn't expect him to look as good as he did. In the final championship fight on this card, we have Amanda Nunes versus Jermaine Duranami. Uh This fight has already happened, and Nunes had won that one before. Uh, now we're going to get the rematch for Duranami. It's good for her to take this fight because there was a lot of uh, mockery coming her way after she refused to fight Cyborg after winning her title, and people were talking about how scared she was. Well, now she's fighting someone who knocked out Cyborg in a minute. So, at least for her, that can sort of help with that storyline that was built around her and that that reputation that she sort of built up by not taking that fight after winning the 145-pound title. Um, But if she gets a win here, that'd be enormous for her and would really shake up the the women's divisions. Uh, If she does get the win, it'd be interesting to see how they go about making a rematch, whether that rematch would be at 145, so Duranami would have a chance to become a double champion, or whether it'd be at 135. Um, But I, I, I don't see that being a concern either way. I think Nunes is going to have the power on the feet to, to really limit Duranami's options, um, is going to be able to, to mix in enough takedown attempts to also really put the striking in her favor. And I, I, I just see Amanda Nunes getting a finish here like she does with most. But Duranami is one of the tougher people, tougher matches for Nunes. Nunes, her, her her grappling isn't often predicated on like shooting in for takedowns. She's more of a judo player than a wrestler. Uh, so for her, she's had a lot of success just outstriking opponents, and that's included Holly Holm and some other high-level strikers. Um, and I mean, it also included Jermaine Durandamy. Uh, but Durandamy is one of the better strikers in the women's division. So if Amanda plans to continue to, to fight most people on the feet, having a matchup against Durandamy is a tougher matchup than a lot of other people out there. So we'll see how it goes, but I, I'd figure Nunes is probably going to get the win here. Next fight on the card is Marlon Moraes versus Jose Aldo, who hasn't exactly looked great in the pictures that we've seen of him. Definitely looks dehydrated. Uh, there have been some people arguing that he, he looks like shit. Other people who, who are arguing that, oh, he just looks like he's... He's on pace to make 135. I don't think 135 was a, was the right right call for him to, to try to go for that weight. I I don't know if he's going to make it, even if he does. Uh, how much that's going to drain him. If you're looking the way that he is looking in these pictures, even if he does make weight, one of the problems with trying to cut a lot of weight is that your your fight camp ends up going from being something based more around strategy and technique to to really having a major focus on weight. And it, it's definitely better to have more focus on how you're going to fight than just making weight or how you're going to fight on Saturday and making weight on Friday. And it seems as though Aldo's focus right now is a lot more on making weight on Friday uh, than it could be on fighting on Saturday. And I think that's going to be an issue for him. Not to say that Marlon doesn't cut a lot of weight too, but I really just don't like this idea of the experiment of him coming down to 135. Now, granted, if he gets the win here, uh, it it wouldn't take long for him to get into a title fight, but I I just don't like the idea right now. And I I just hope no one gets seriously seriously hurt here, but I'd probably have to pick Mariah just based off what we've seen from Aldo in terms of the weight cut. And then the first fight on the card is going to be Peter Yan versus Uriah Faber. Uh, looks like a terrible matchup for Uriah Faber. Faber is likely to have a lot of difficulty taking Yan down. Yan's a very difficult guy to take down, let alone hold down. And on the feet, Yan is a better striker than Uriah Faber is. So this seems to be a fight where, worst case scenario for Yan, he probably wins this fight by decision, but I, I think there's a good chance he finishes Faber here. Yeah, Faber has enough power where if he lands a shot, he might be able to, to put him out and, and steal a win here, but... If, if this fight happens 100 times, I don't see Yan losing any more than 10, if not less. Uh, on the prelims, we have Jeff Neal versus Mike Perry, which is surprising because Mike Perry, I did not think, would be back so soon after having his nose absolutely mangled by Vicente Luque, but here he is. Jeff Neal, very dangerous striker. You figure this fight's going to be on the feet for the most part, and with the heat that these guys both throw, it's, someone's probably going out. Granted, Perry has improved grappling. Uh, his wrestling's not too bad. He's a, a decent purple belt on the ground. I think Neal's a purple belt as well. Um... So there is a chance that this does go to the ground and we see some ground and pound, but given the um, given the way that both of these guys fight, I think there's a pretty good chance that this just ends up being a war on the feet. And hopefully for Perry, his nose doesn't get bu- doesn't get busted again. But 
I guess that's always a possibility. Then we have Ketlin Vieira versus Irene Aldana. We have Ian, Ian Heinish versus Omari Akhmedov. And then a fight that you wouldn't expect to be happening in 2019, uh, more like a, a 2010 fight between Matt Brown and Ben Saunders. Then on the early prelims, we have Chase Hooper versus Daniel Tamer. Chase Hooper, I believe, is 19 or 20 years old, uh, had a good showing on the UFC Contender Series. Uh, so he's being looked at as a really good prospect just because he's young. Versus Daniel Tamer, very good kickboxer. Not as good on the ground, but every fight starts on the feet, so we'll see how this goes. Then we have Brandon Moreno versus Kai Kara France. Very good fight at flyweight. Uh, Jessica I returning after her last fight being a title fight. On the early prelim, she's returning against Vivian Arujo. And then we have Punahele Soriano versus Oscar Pijota. Soriano, very good wrestler, coming off the Contender Series. And Oscar Pijota, former ADCC qualifier. Last fight was against Adolfo Vieira. Looked pretty decent on the ground in terms of fending off Vieira before eventually succumbing to an arm triangle in the second round. Uh, so he's a pretty solid all-around fighter. I'm definitely excited to see how he, he matches up with a guy in Soriano who likes to just throw wild strikes on the feet, and when he takes his guys, takes his opponents down, I don't know if he's going to want to take Pijota down because that might not go particularly well for him. So pretty interesting fight to start the card off. Uh, but that covers it for UFC 245. Uh, now moving on to Bo Nickel versus Gordon Ryan. I did a video on this, and I think as far as like a technical breakdown of the match, I think that's probably where you, where you should go to, to, to see how it worked out because uh, I have like 45 screenshots, and they're just going in chronicle, chronological order. Uh, but a rough a rough recap on what happened in the fight or in that match. There were no leg, lock, leg locks allowed and no guard pulling allowed, but there are leg entanglements allowed. And what Gordon Ryan was able to do early on was take advantage of Bo Nickel getting a, a high underhook on him. Uh, Ryan would then take an overhook on that and then shoot in on a flying scissor takedown. Did it three separate times. Now, unfortunately for him, whenever he'd get it, it'd be towards the edge of the mat. And then if they went out of bounds, the ref would restart them in neutral or standing rather than restart in the same position that he was in. Uh, so he had to get that position a few different times. And every time he'd get there, he, he'd start to work his way up uh, to finish a sweep. And Bo Nickel did a fantastic job of finding a way to to get clear of Ryan to, um, and then be able to get back to his feet. So he never gave up a sweep there, even though Ryan was getting pretty close a couple different times. Um, but obviously Ryan couldn't go for a heel, even though it was there. So if leg locks were legal, this match would have been over within a couple minutes. Um, but they weren't, so Ryan was not able to finish the fight at that point. Uh, but after the third time of hitting the flying scissor takedown, Bo Nickel stopped um, going for underhooks and was just kind of pushing away on Ryan. So he had a, a period of about, I believe it was like six to eight minutes, where Nickel was just trying to, to stall and wait until the end of the match where he could get a takedown. Uh, Ryan did get two points at one point uh, when they went out of bounds. I think the ref was thinking it was like a submission attempt, even though the leg locks weren't legal. And since they went off the mat, in a normal jiu-jitsu situation, if you're attempting a submission and your opponent defends the proper way, but they go off the mat, then it's two points. So they aren't defending the proper way, and they're just fleeing. That's a DQ win. Um, but whatever the case may be, Gordon Ryan had two points at that point, but it seemed as though Bo Nichols' plan was then to take him down late to, to tie it up, given the way that the score was, um, and then see what he could do from there. Um, so he had no interest in taking Gordon down. Gordon wasn't getting close to taking him down. So you kind of had a really frustrating period of time where not a whole lot was happening. Eventually, Gordon, uh, tired of baiting single legs, um, starts kind of doing like this donkey guard Jeff Glover thing where he just sort of like walks toward him with his butt facing him and not not facing Bo Nickel. And eventually Bo decides he's had enough of it, decides to suplex him. And with about three minutes to go, Bo is then forced to, to actually grapple on top because in jiu-jitsu you can't just take a guy down and leave him down. The whole point of grappling is to control your opponent and then submit him. If you are not engaging someone, you're not controlling them, let alone submitting them. So he was forced to, to try to engage with Gordon on the ground. Gordon eventually gets underneath him on a butterfly guard sweep attempt, uh, which is one that he, he likes to use often where he has like this um, straight arm lock attempt. Uh, you can get the straight arm lock from there, but oftentimes Gordon just ends up getting a sweep off of it, a uh, butterfly sweeping over in the direction of the arm that's being taken away or the post that's being taken away. In this case, Bo does a really good job of basing out and t taking away that sweep, but in the process, uh, by putting his right hand on the mat, Gordon's able to push off of his hip, uh, throw a leg over for a triangle. Bo does a good job of posturing up, uh, goes for a slam to, to slam his way out of the triangle, ends up putting himself a little bit deeper, and then gets tapped out by the triangle. So Gordon Ryan gets the victory here. Uh, so a couple things to talk about is if this match actually does happen again, how would it go? Because after Bo Nickel made the adjustment on those flying scissor takedowns, Gordon was having a lot more trouble. Um, if we assume that this match starts from 0-0 again and Gordon Ryan doesn't have the ability to get on get in on those flying scissor takedowns and doesn't get the first two points, it, it's possible that if Bo Nickel's a little bit more... Um, discipline that he's able to get the, get a takedown late and do just enough not to get submitted and actually win this match given the rule set 
So the question would be, if these guys do face each other again in a grappling match, and they do another one of those mixed rules grappling matches, does Bo Nickel actually now know that he has a way to win this match? Uh, he lasted about 45 seconds before he, he got submitted. So for him, if you wait until about 30, 45 seconds left to go, I'm, I'm sure he's able to get the takedown there. If, if guard pulling is not allowed, then Goran can't just pull guard through there. He just has to defend takedowns. Uh, so to me, what this shows is that this specific rule set, the no leg locks and the no guard pulling rule set, is one where if Bo Nickel won, or if another wrestler versus Jiu-Jitsu Jiu star match happens, if they follow this rule set, and I think the point of these rule sets is to actually make it competitive and give the wrestler a chance to give the person from the other sport a chance, there actually is a way for, for the wrestler to win this match. Granted, I would like to see the next time this comes around, if a, the wrestler is doing what Bo Nickel is doing, which is just pushing away and not actually trying to attempt takedowns even when they were being given to him, you'd like to see more penalties um, handed out, so I think part of that's on the ref, but the way that this match went, it was definitely interesting to see that Bo Nickel did have a path to victory here, even though he didn't end up following it. Um, but as far as this whole idea of grappler versus jiu-jitsu guy, I think it's pretty clear, and I think for the most part everyone understands that if you have, and we'll use Bo and Gordon as the examples here, if you have Bo the wrestler versus Gordon, the jiu-jitsu guy, and it's a wrestling match, Bo's going to win that match. Bo knows that, Gordon knows that. If you have a match between Bo and Gordon in a pure jiu-jitsu match, um, whether you're not making concessions for leg locks, you're not making concessions for guard pulling. I think everyone understands Gordon wins that. I think Bo understands that. I think Gordon understands that. So with them making these mixed matches where they're, they're sort of like mixed, mismatching rules where it's saying, okay, we'll do a jiu-jitsu match, but to make it easier for the wrestler, no guard pulling. To make it easier for the wrestler, no leg locks. It, it's clear that the point of this isn't Bo. Bo's not trying to say, hey, let, let me see how good of a jiu-jitsu guy I am. I'm going to see where I rank among the best in the world in jiu-jitsu. And if Gordon takes a match in wrestling, it's not as though Gordon's like, let me see where I rank in the world of wrestling. I think the idea is here, they're just trying to put on a fun event, an event that a lot of people are interested in, in watching. And if you're doing it where it's Gordon versus Bo in a jiu-jitsu match, though it's still cool to kind of see Bo doing a jiu-jitsu match, it's a little less interesting because it's like, well, Bo's not going to win that. I don't see how he could possibly win it. But when you sort of mix up the rules here, you do introduce the possibility of the guy who's entering the opposite sport having a chance to win. So... With them doing these matches, eventually I'd like to see it get to a point where if you're going to have a jiu-jitsu match, just have a jiu-jitsu match. But I understand that the point of these matches isn't to actually like put Bo Nickel on like a jiu-jitsu competitive ladder and see where he lands. The idea isn't to put Gordon Ryan on a wrestling competitive ladder and see where he, where he lands. The idea is to make an interesting match that people want to see. Uh, throw it on top of a card with other matches that are more jiu-jitsu specific, like in, in this case where you got like a Hummel of Bahal versus... Jake Shields, you got Edwin Nashby on the card too. Um, so I get why they're doing it. It's more of like an entertainment thing. It's more of like a one-off. It's more of like an actual super fight. But moving forward, I would like to see more just just pure matches where you're either getting a pure wrestling match or a pure jiu-jitsu match and, and then just seeing them go from there. Even though you, you may know what's going to happen, it, it, it's sort of like if Bo Nickel won this match, what would it really mean? Like, yes, he would have won a grappling match against Gordon Ryan, and you could say he won a grappling match against Gordon Ryan, but he would have won a grappling match against Gordon Ryan where Gordon Ryan was not allowed to pull guard, which is allowed in pretty much every other form of grappling. He would have won a grappling match against Gordon Ryan where Gordon Ryan had him in a position where he could have easily he hooked him but wasn't allowed to by the rules. Like, what, what does it really mean? So it, it sort of takes away from the meaning of, of winning this match, particularly if the guy who is going into the, the opposite sport ends up winning it. So I would like to see where where it actually means something if the other guy wins. But that being said, it was still a fun match. It was still cool to see. It was interesting to see how Bo Nickel was able to fight off sweeps from Gordon Ryan. It was interesting to see how Bo Nickel dealt with challenges from one of the best jiu-jitsu guys in the world. Well, I guess the best jiu-jitsu guy in the world. Uh, so in that way, it was pretty cool. Um, one more topic to, to build off of this, though. We did have a match that went the other way where you had Nick Rodriguez, who was the ADCC silver medalist, going up against Pat Downey in a modified wrestling match. Uh, I think the modifications were more so just so Downey couldn't just take him down and roll him a couple times and, and get a tech fall really easy. I think Downey just had to, rather than be able to take someone down, leg legs him a couple times and when you'd have to take him down multiple times. Uh, so that was the way that that was designed, but Pat Downey absolutely dominated that match. Uh, so now Pat Downey and Nick Rodriguez are looking at facing each other in a jiu-jitsu match. And what, inter what interests me a lot about this one is that I actually think Pat Downey has a very good chance to win here. To my knowledge, Pat Downey actually has been training jiu-jitsu for a little bit, uh, I believe he's been training with Gordon Ryan for a little. He's also been a part of Colby Covington's camp for this upcoming fight. Uh, so Jiu-Jitsu isn't something that he's not completely aware of. And for Nick Rodriguez, his success in Jiu-Jitsu hasn't really been from like being able to fight off his back. or 
just having great jujitsu fundamentals and like your positions you're used to, like Delahiva, X guard, close guard, um, half guard. So Rodriguez is normally able to win his matches because he's the better wrestler than the jujitsu guy he's facing, and he just kind of keeps it on the feet, stays more active. So if it's a tie, he usually wins a ref's decision based on activity. Um, but if he gets on top, uh, he'll be able to sort of make a large movement to try to pass, try to take the back. Sometimes he's able to take the back, and then he has a pretty decent choke off the back from there. Um, but against a guy like Pat Downey, I don't know how he's going to be able to get top position. I don't know if I see, see him sweeping Pat Downey. Um, so then he would have to take Pat Downey down. That obviously didn't work out for him in the wrestling match. So if he's fighting off his back, we're really going to see what Nick Rodriguez is capable of doing off his back if Pat Downey's going to put him there. And maybe Rodriguez has a decent guard. Maybe Rodriguez has a decent triangle. It's just not something we've seen yet because he hasn't really had to do it in other matches. So to me, this is actually a really compelling matchup and one where I think even under ADCC rules, it'd be interesting to see how Downey versus Rodriguez matches up just from a pure style standpoint. Uh, I don't know that Downey would be as successful against the guys who Rodriguez has beat as Rodriguez was, but I think between these two fighting each other, there's a chance that Downey could potentially get the win here. So this match is set for March. Can't wait to see it. And I really want to see how, how everything works out. And if Rodriguez does get put on his back, I really want to see how R- Rodriguez fights off his back because that's not something we've had to see. Anytime Rodriguez gets put on his butt, for the most part, he's just trying to work his way back up and get back to standing so he can wrestle again. Uh, so really interesting matchup here and can't wait to see it. Next thing to talk about is going to be the CKLV or Cliff Keen Las Vegas tournament. Big tournament in college wrestling. Uh, had some big teams like Nebraska and Ohio State that ended up showing up for this. So I'll just recap um, each of the divisions. So at 125, the winner was Jack Mueller from University of Virginia. He ends up beating Devin Schroeder from Purdue in the finals there. Mueller was a finalist in the NCAAs last year, ended up losing to Spencer Lee after beating Sebastian Rivera. So for him, he was expected to win this. He was the number one seed. He does get the win here, so everything works out as planned for him there. At 133, in the finals, we have Chaz Tucker or Charles Tucker from Cornell versus Montori Bridges of Wyoming. Uh, these guys are the one and two seeds in this bracket. Uh, ends up working out that way where they face each other in the finals and Tucker gets the win. Tucker was the number one seed from Cornell, uh, so big win for him. Cornell's in a bit of a weird spot this year where a lot of their best guys are taking Olympic red shirts, so they, they still have Tucker going out there, and it's good for them to, to get a win in a tournament like this from, out of Tucker, but it seems like it's going to be a tough year for them with Yanni out of the lineup, with Max Dean out of the lineup, and with um, Vito out of the lineup at 125. At 141, we have Luke Pletcher and Mitch McKee facing off in the finals. Pletcher got a major decision over Chad Red to get to the finals, which was pretty big for him. McKee got a win over Dom Demas by a score of 5-2. to two. Also a really big win for him, so Pletcher was the number one seed in this. McKee was the number three seed. Pletcher's looked fantastic this year. He was uh, sort of like in that like four to five range at 133 last year. Now he's number one at 141, so moving up a weight. Um, but looked very good. Was able to get a pretty clean win against Mitch, Mitch McKee by a score of 10 to 6. Uh, so a real big win for him. Uh, really solidifies him at the number one spot in the weight class. At 149... Bit of an upset in the semis, or I guess a couple of upsets. We had Brayton Lee, the number five seed, heading into this, beating Max Thompson. And then we had Jared Deegan falling to Sammy Sasso by medical forfeit. Uh, so then we have a finals match between Brayton Lee and Sammy Sasso. A uh, real high-energy match. Lee was in, in on his attacks a lot more than Sasso was. A lot more aggressive. Sasso got a late takedown uh, to make it a little bit closer, but Lee ends up winning this match by a score of 6-4. to four. Then at 157, bit of an upset here. Uh, but we had Hayden Hiley, the number one overall guy in the nation, a guy who nearly beat Jason Nolf last year in the NCAA tournament versus Ryan Deacon, who had been very strong for much of the year. Um, pretty much Nolf was the one guy who was giving him problems. He really wasn't running into Hiley before then anyway. Um, but then has a bit of a rough run at the Big Tens, then also at NCAA, since up losing to Caleb Young a couple of times of Iowa. Uh, so he was ranked a little bit lower at the start of the year than you would expect out of him, uh, even though he had a pretty good freestyle season. Um, but for him... He gets a 9-3 win over David Carr, who just had a 6-1 win over Caleb Young, and then gets a 6-2 win over Hayden Hydley in the finals, which was really big for him. Then at 165, we have Isaiah White out of Nebraska. He ended up facing Joshua Shields of Arizona State in the finals. Uh, in terms of the semis, this was 1-4 versus four and 2-3. versus 1-2 and two won their matches, so then 1-2 and two faced each other in the finals. One was Isaiah White, two was Josh Shields, and White wins this match by a score of 3-1. to one. I believe it was an overtime takedown. Uh, after they were tied 1-1. One to one. At 174, we had Bryce Steyard and Dylan Lighty in the finals. Steyard out of UNI, Northern Iowa. Dylan Lighty out of Purdue. After getting a win over Labriola, Lighty ended up facing Steyard in the finals. Wins that match 3-1. Uh, so Lighty gets the win there at 174. At 184, this is Zahid Valencia's weight. And he made that known. At a match with Sammy Colbray, 
who was top five a couple weeks ago, uh, ends up teching him by a score of 26 to eight, just runs right through him. Uh, then has Louis Dupres, number four in the nation from Binghamton, Bingham, Binghamton uh, beat Tim 13 to four. And then the final is Trent Hidley, who's had a fantastic year uh, so far. He gets majored as well by Zahid Valencia. Uh, but Hidley beat Taylor Luan to get to the final, so still a big one for him. And you figure he's still going to move up in the rankings, even though he lost pretty badly to Zahid. Zahid's going to be the number one guy. Uh, I mean, he already is, but he'll remain number one after that. Then at 197, Colin Moore ended up running through the field here. Uh, had a close match with Kendall Norfleet of Arizona State, won by a score of 5-3, to three, but then beat Thomas Lane, who, if he wasn't an All-American last year, he was pretty close, um, but beat him by Tech Fall 16-1 in three minutes. Uh, then beat Christian Brunner by a score of 16-6 to six in the finals. Uh, Brunner was able to get to the finals by beating Jacob Woodley of Oklahoma in the semifinals by a score of 2-1. to one. And then at 285, we're at heavyweight. We had Mason Paris with a really dominant performance. He also had a really good freestyle season, so it'll be interesting to see where he finishes it this year. But he beat Christian Lance in the semis, uh, and then beat Tanner Hall by a score of six to three in the finals. Tanner Hall beat Orndorff uh, by a score of three to one to get to the finals as the number three seed. Uh, so that covers it for CKLV. Uh, back to the UFC, a couple of somewhat surprising, but not well. I, one of them was surprising, one of them was not so surprising. So Henan Burrell, I guess you could say not so surprising. I think he's on a five fight losing streak right now. Former champion though, so anytime a former champion gets cut, uh, that, that's definitely surprising in its own right. But Burrell, after winning the title, or after getting knocked off by T.J. Dillashaw, has really had a rough time. Uh, hasn't really been able to do enough of the striking, which used to be very dominant for him. Um, but hasn't done enough, enough of the striking to be able to take guys to the ground once he gets the fights to the ground. Uh, isn't terribly effective at taking the back weight like he used to be. Uh, we remember right when he had a, had the title run, just fantastic on the ground. Really quick, ba- really quick back takes, good finishes from the back. Um, also good top control as well. And the grappling we just haven't seen seen what's there that much out of him in this five fight losing streak and on the feet it just hasn't been as good he's been getting beat up pretty badly as well so for him it's probably for the better that he gets released here hopefully he decide. hopefully he has enough money saved up and decides that this MMA career is done and maybe moves into competitive grappling if he still wants to compete in in, in combat sports and and that'll be it for him as for Liz Carmouche had a very uninspiring fight with Valentina Shevchenko but that was a while back Shevchenko's already been rebooked um or been booked with another fight uh, so it's sort of weird that Carmouche would get released right now at, a, at, at any point. I don't know what the reasoning for that was. Uh, I believe she was also doing some work for the UFC, um, doing some PR work for them as well. Uh, so that's odd as well. So her getting cut, I, I would like for there to be someone who could at least like get in contact with whoever made that decision at the UFC and at least like get a get an explanation of both why and why now because uh, it seems a little bit odd. I think she's also ranked number four in the division right now. Granted... 125 is not a very strong division at all. Um, so being number four in that division that's, doesn't doesn't necessarily say that you're like a fantastic fighter, but it, it's surprising to see her get cut. At, at where she's at in the division, I guess the UFC is trying to figure, look, you're either, if you're in the UFC, you're either going to be working your way to a title, you're going to help other people work their way to the title in terms of being a name that you, people can build off of, or you're going to be someone who sells. Carmouche probably isn't someone who sells. Um, I guess they figured after that loss of Shevchenko, she's not someone who's going to likely ever win a title. Uh, so then the next question would be, is she going to be someone who, someone up and coming, maybe like a Macy Barber is going to beat and be able to work off of her name and work her way to a title. Maybe they feel like that's not in the cards for her. I I, I just don't know why they would cut her at this point. I, I think with the division being where it's at, it's better to keep around top five fighters than top five fighters. Um, really let that division grow and let, let, this, let some skilled people work their way in let someone who's lower ranked but maybe a better fighter than Liz beat Liz and then really solidify that number four spot and make that number four, four spot mean something more than it means right now. Uh, so weird decision there. I don't know why they did it, but I, I guess at this point it is what it is. Next topic to talk about is going to be the IBJJF black belt, or well, black belt is what I'm talking about, but the Nogi World Championships. Uh, so at this point, all we have is the registration list from IBJJF to, to go off of in terms of who's competing. With the IBJJF, they make people fill out their full names, and with a lot of these Brazilians, they have like four different names. So sometimes it's hard to recognize who's who because we're used to knowing people by like, like with Bouchesha, you just know him as Bouchesha, or maybe like Marcus Almeida. But whenever you look at a, a roster from the IBJJF, it's got like four different middle names as well. So sometimes it's not easy to tell. Uh, so I'll, I'll look at the list right now and at least see the names that I recognize. So at Rooster Weight, uh, we have Christian Woodmancy from Atos. Uh, Talison Suarez is going to be in that weight class as well. There's only going to be seven people in here, uh, so you'd figure if everyone gets three matches to a champ or three wins to a title, 
Um, it'll be interesting to see if Woodman C is able, actually able to to get the win here. At 135, or not 135, at Light Feather, which I think is 141 with the Gi on. Although, no Gi is a little bit different. Uh, but we have Lucas Pinero in that weight class. Uh, Joao Miao is going to be there. Uh, we also have Richard Alicorn and Edwin Junior Ocasio. That's a pretty good division there. A total of eight competitors. So again, uh, three wins to to a gold. I think with these tournaments for the IBJJF now, it used to be where for a world championship anyone could sign up. Uh, but for this, I think you actually have to have a certain amount of ranking points to qualify for Nogi World. So that's probably part of the reason why these brackets aren't all that big. At featherweight, uh, it's a 14-person bracket. In terms of some of the names that stand out, Thomas Halpin, who is at it at ADCC uh, out of Fight Sports, he'll be in this bracket. Um, Tiago Macedo is going to be in the bracket. Cole Franson. It's a lot of longer names that I don't exactly recognize in, in terms of how IBJJF has them written out. I would probably some other names in there that are, are more familiar, but I'm not catching right now. Um, at lightweight, it's going to be 17 people, so four to, four to gold, unless you end up being the one person, or the two among the two people who are in that one um, round of 32 match. Um, but from here, let's see if we got any big names. Um, not any big names that really stand out. I guess Rodrigo Freitas would be one. Um, oh, Samir Chantry is going to be in it as well. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating with IBJJF how they have these listed out. It's not always clear who's who. Um, at middleweight, we have 18 people in there. Um, so Jonathan Satava, who is known as like a mini Marcelo Garcia, he trains under Marcelo. He'll be in this bracket. We have Dante Leon, which is going to be interesting. He had that big win over Lucas Lepre at ADCC. Um, Robbie, Robert Maloff, uh, pretty good wrestling. Um, good black belt out of GF team. Otavio Souza is... Oh, wow, Otavio Souza is going to be in this. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, so pretty solid bracket there. And that'll be at middleweight. At medium heavy, we're going to have... Looks like Janatis Gracie out of Atos is going to be in that bracket. Uh, Nassar, who's one of the guys who gets talked about a lot on the Map Room podcast, is going to be in that bracket. Um... Gabriel Almeida will be in this bracket. Jake Watson. Manuel Ribamar. So a pretty solid bracket here at medium heavy. At heavyweight, we got 10 total people, so it could be three to four matches to get to a title here. Jackson Souza's in here. Adam Wardzinski's in here. Uh, Devontae Bones Johnson's going to be in there. Morello Santana's going to be in there. So pretty strong bracket there. A couple good checkmat guys, a couple good unity guys in there. And then for super heavy... We have Vinicius Gazzola, who is the silver medalist at ADCC, lost to Gordon Ryan in the, in his weight class in the finals. Um, we have Helton De Silva. I feel like I've seen that name before. Tex Johnson is going to be in this bracket. Uh, I'm not sure what the rule set is with IBJJF in terms of heel hooks at black belt. I don't think heel hooks are allowed in IBJJF even at black belt, which is kind of stupid and part of the reason why the IBJJF World Championship doesn't mean as much in Nogi as ADCC does. Um, and Elliot Kelly will be in that bracket as well. So a bracket of 11 people there. And then at Ultra Heavy, a bracket of six people. Um, but we're going to have Vinny Magalesh will be in that bracket, uh, which is the guy who's in the picture with that win at ACB over G Gordon Ryan. Uh, the picture, of course, is on the YouTube version. There's obviously no picture in the audio version of this podcast. Um, Victor Hugo will be in that bracket. James Pupo will be in that bracket. Uh, Roberto Cyborg Abreu. Oh, wow. So that'll actually be a really strong bracket there. So so four pretty big names there in, in a group of six there. So depending on how the bracket works out, that could be two to a title or three to a title. But either way, pretty cool bracket right there. Uh, so that'll cover it for IBJJF. And the last topic to cover here, uh, just briefly, will be Alberto Del Rio versus Tito Ortiz. This was a match where it was pretty clear from the start that Ortiz had a massive advantage. Alberto Del Rio actually was a decent... Or Alberto Rodriguez or whatever his actual name is, was actually a pretty good... Um, I believe it was a freestyle wrestler, but obviously his professional focus was in professional wrestling, not in professional fighting. Meanwhile, Tito Ortiz was focused in professional fighting, uh, so pretty good college wrestler who was able to get some decent striking on top of that, uh, earn a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and when the good wrestler with the black belt in jiu-jitsu and the really good striking faces off against the guy who can just wrestle, you would figure that the guy who is well-rounded is going to win, and that's exactly what happened. Tito Ortiz gets the win here. Didn't watch the fight. Didn't, didn't think much of the fight. That was a stupid fight. Um, 
it's just Kombucha America is just trying to, to build some interest for their card. I don't know that they made their money back on this pay-per-view, but that's definitely something they went for. Uh, but what was interesting to me was that after the fight happened, uh, the president retweeted Kombucha America's Twitter account showing Tito Ortiz getting his hand raised while wearing just this absurd fight kit with a, a picture of like the Punisher skull with an American flag on it with Trump's hair and uh, having Trump 2020 on his fight shorts. And Donald Trump uh, just retweeted and said, good job, way to pick up a win with win all capitalized. So I guess that's one of those win so much you may even get tired of winning type of situations. But I guess to bring it back around to what we're going to be talking about next week, we're going to have Colby Covington potentially getting his, his championship. If he does get the win, you'll figure that Donald Trump will tweet him out as well. And we'll see if Colby Covington wins to the point where he gets tired of winning as well. But I guess that's your preview for next week. Um, obviously, UFC 245 will be the big thing to cover. I'll be recapping the Black Belt or the um, the Nogi World Championships as well. Um, we'll see if anything else comes up between now and then. Um, but that covers it for this week. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed the fights, and hope you'll enjoy the fights that are coming up the week after.